Today's video is sponsored by Conflict of Nations, a free online strategy game that gathers millions of players worldwide. You fight up to 64 other players in real time in games that can take weeks to complete. The game is set in the early 21st century and features modern day weapons and technology as you would expect. Your objective is to take over the world. You define your own strategy, build powerful armies by combining dozens of different types of infantry, tanks, and planes, and you fight for world domination in a challenging PvP environment. Now, if real-time modern warfare sounds like your kind of game, you can join a huge community of millions of players, both in the game and on Discord, and use your diplomatic skills to forge alliances with other players. Everything is fully optimized for cross-platform gaming, with the same account working on both PC and mobile. So if this sounds like your sort of game, just click the link in the description below to jump into a game of Conflict of Nations. And as a special bonus, you guys will receive a special gift when you sign up using my link. You can snag 13,000 gold in a month of premium subscription for free. So click the link in the description, choose a country, and fight your way to victory in epic real-time battles. See you on the battlefield. And now, today's video. During World War II, pilots had to get up close and personal with their adversaries to have any chance of making a kill. Though the heavy machine guns and cannons in most aircraft were capable of firing accurately well past 500 yards, this usually involved aviators in classic warbirds like Spitfires, Mustangs, ME-109s and A6M-0s screaming through the skies less than 100 yards off their enemies' tails. As dramatic as it was, just a few short years after the war ended, previously unimaginable advances in air-to-air -air weaponry led Navy and Air Force brass to conclude that guns and cannons would eventually be unnecessary thanks to a new breed of weapons poised to revolutionize aerial combat. Fast forward two decades to the skies over Taiwan when the venerable Sidewinder missile made its debut. Now, instead of squeezing a trigger and hoping to down the enemy in a hail of lead, Jet Age pilots relied on a supersonic missile that tracked targets from great distances using a superheated engine exhaust as a homing beacon. Though early Sidewinders were used extensively in Vietnam too, they weren't as effective as the Navy hoped they'd be, but over the following decades, they'd go on to become the world's preeminent air to air weapons. The AIM-9 Sidewinder is a short-range air intercept missile that's been around since the mid-1950s. Originally adopted by the Navy in 1956, Sidewinders also entered service with the Air Force in 1964, just before America got involved in Vietnam. Though original Sidewinders were a far cry from today's variants, in more than a few ways, they were surprisingly similar. But though they weren't introduced until the 1950s, the concept and development began in the 1940s, and much of the technology on which the missiles were ultimately based originated, surprise, surprise, in Nazi Germany, where researchers had designed cutting-edge infrared guidance systems for long-range rockets. The Nazis' tracking systems were revolutionary, but much of the work of mating them to actual weapons had gone undone by war's end. Immediately after the war, intelligence teams from Britain, America, and the Soviet Union began collecting data from these projects and whisking it back to their respective countries, along with many of the engineers who developed it. This information was analyzed by the military and quietly disseminated to trusted companies in the weapons and aircraft fields, a few of which already had fledgling missile projects in the works. Sidewinder development officially began in 1946 at the Naval Ordnance Test Station in Inyakern, California, known now as the Naval Air Weapons Station China Lake. Designated Local Fuse Project 602, catchy, the program was the brainchild of U.S. Navy physicist William Burdett McLean, who is credited with being the father of the heat-seeking Sidewinder missile. Later, McLean worked with big defense contractors like Ford Aerospace and the Laurel Corporation, but in the early going, the project didn't have official funding, but it progressed on a relatively small budget with a mostly volunteer workforce. The program was officially funded in 1951, and the name Sidewinder was selected after the venomous rattlesnake snakes found across much of the American Southwest, which use heat-detecting sensory organs to hunt warm-blooded prey like mice, rats, and ground squirrels. Originally called the Sidewinder 1, after years of relatively slow and tedious developments, the first live firing took place in early September of 1952, but the new weapon wouldn't actually intercept a slow-moving drone until a year later. It was a huge milestone, and over the following year, more than four dozen additional tests were carried out 
with moderate success. The military was sufficiently impressed to authorize production in 1955, and sidewinders were first used operationally in 1956 on Navy Grumman F9F8 Cougars and FJ3 Furies. These days, sidewinders are nearly 10 feet, that's 3.1 meters long, have diameters of 5 inches, 127 millimeters, and weigh just a hair under 190 pounds or 87 kilograms. Most variants carry a 20.8 pound, 9.4 kilogram annular blast fragmentation warhead that detonate when they get close to their targets. The resulting explosion sends a field of shrapnel over a relatively large area, somewhat like a shotgun blast, which increases the likelihood of making a kill. Since fast, high-flying jets are elusive targets, this type of warhead is common on anti-aircraft and anti-missile missiles. The detonation mechanism is an infrared sensing proximity fuse similar to those used in American anti-aircraft shells during the Second World War. Powered by a single solid-fuel rocket, sidewinders can reach speeds of up to Mach 2.5, that's 1,980 miles an hour or 3,086 kilometers an hour, and their ranges stretch from just six-tenths of a mile, about a kilometer, to nearly 22 miles or 30 5.4 kilometers. But contrary to popular belief, sidewinders aren't actually guided to their target's actual location, but instead to its anticipated change in position, which is calculated multiple times per second using factors like speed and course. Sidewinders first saw combat during the Second Taiwan Strait Crisis in September 1958 with the Republic of China Air Force, which is the name of Taiwan's Air Force. It's a long story, but during the conflict, ROCAF F-86 Sabres were routinely engaged in air battles with MiG-17s from the People's Republic of China over the Taiwan Strait. The MiGs were faster, had better climb rates, and higher service ceilings, which meant that they could fly out of harm's way above their counterparts and choose when and where they wanted to engage. The scenario was maddening and embarrassing for the Americans and Taiwanese, but since the Sabres were only equipped with cannons, there wasn't anything they could do about it. That said, the first ever air-to-air -air missile engagement took place on September the 24th, when ROCAF Sabres, packing secretly procured sidewinders, fired on unsuspecting MiG-17 that had been cruising smugly above them. All told, more than 100 MiGs clashed with nearly three dozen F-86s. When the proverbial smoke had cleared, 25 MiGs had been downed all by the revolutionary missiles that weren't even supposed to be there in the first place. Though the conflict lasted into October, only six more MiGs were shot down compared to only two F-86s lost, making it one of the most lopsided air wars of the 20th century. However, though the moment was historic, just weeks later another similar engagement ended in disaster from a transfer of technology standpoint when an AIM-9B fired from a Sabre stuck in the fuselage of a MiG-17 and failed to explode. Along with his potentially deadly prize, the MiG pilot gingerly guided his plane home and the dud missile wound up in the hands of Soviet engineers who considered the unexpected gift a free university course or, more accurately, a postdoctoral degree in missile technology. And big shocker, the Sidewinder was reverse engineered in the Vimpel K-13 R-3S missile, which ended Soviet service more than a decade later. Rumor has it that the AIM-9 was copied so closely that the Soviets didn't even bother changing the part numbers. And as they say, well, number one, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and two, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. According to official statistics, 452 sidewinders were fired during the Vietnam War, resulting in less than 100 kills. By comparison, in World War II, Army Air Force pilots scored more than 15,000 aerial victories, and in Korea, F-86s shot down nearly 800 enemy aircraft. In short, air dominance was slipping, largely because sidewinders had kill probabilities of less than 20%, despite America's better training and tactics, and arguably better airplanes. The MiGs flown by the Vietnam People's Air Force were small and nimble, and like the Chinese did over Taiwan, Vietnamese pilots usually avoided confrontation until the conditions swung to their advantage, which wasn't very often. These days, sidewinders are the most well-known of all Western air-to-air -air missiles, but they weren't the only ones streaming through the skies over Vietnam. In fact, of all Air Force kills, nearly 60% were made with radar-guided AIM-7 Sparrows, while Navy pilots made all of theirs with heat-seeking AIM-9 Sidewinders. But in the early going, when Sidewinders were fired from F-4s, the pilots had no backup if their missiles failed to hit their marks, because at that time, Phantoms weren't equipped with cannons. 
This was corrected later, and Navy pilots increasingly relied on guns, especially in close-range situations. The next major advantage in Sidewinder development came with the AM9L Lima in the 1970s. The new Limas were the first true all-aspect missiles, which meant they could be fired from any orientation in relation to their targets, including from 90-degree angles and when the two aircraft were closing in head-on. AIM-9Ls first saw combat in 1981 when two Navy F-14s, think Top Gun, downed two Libyan Su-22s over the Gulf of Sidra. In the hands of RAF pilots during the Falklands War in 1982, nearly 80% of Sidewinder AIM-9L launches ended in kills and 20 Argentinian aircraft were downed. The AIM-9X entered service in late 2003, years after a competition between Hughes Electronics and Raytheon. The Hughes model won out, after which Raytheon purchased its competitor in a classic case of, if you can't beat him, buy him. Used by Air Force F-15s and Navy F-18s, the new missiles featured substantial upgrades, one of the most prominent of which was a new thrust vectoring system that significantly increased maneuverability. The 9Xs were also compatible with the new US Joint Helmet Mounted Queuing System, JHMCS, which allowed pilots to lock onto targets simply by looking at them, which is pretty rad. These new sidewinders also included internal cooling systems and more streamlined aerodynamics, which translated into improved reliability, range, and speed. But perhaps most importantly, the AM9X Block II demonstrated lock-on after launch capability. Previous variants had to acquire their targets before being fired, which wasn't a problem when they were stored on external hardpoints, but the new development allowed for the possibility of deployment from the internal bomb bays of stealth aircraft like F-35s and F-22s, and at least theoretically, from submarines. In 2008, AM-9Xs were also tested for air-to-ground applications at China Lake, where they proved effective at taking out tanks and other armored vehicles. Then, in 2015, the Army successfully fired Block II missiles from their new multi-mission launcher, a 15-missile truck-mounted battery capable of simultaneously tracking multiple targets. In this new role, Block IIs used a passive infrared seeker that was nearly invisible to detection devices on anti-missile missiles. And though they were more than capable of taking out enemy aircraft, they were also adept at shooting down drones and other missiles themselves. Raytheon continued developing sidewinders into the 2000s, and what might have been the Block III variants would have had longer range and a more powerful warhead. Sadly, for Raytheon shareholders, however, the Block III never was, though some of its features were incorporated into later variants. For decades, the naysayers have been claiming that the Sidewinder was living on borrowed time, but continuous upgrades have made it lethally efficient and surprisingly inexpensive when compared to the cost associated with developing an entirely new missile system. In addition, it's the weapon most capable of dealing with fifth-generation Russian and Chinese jets, unmanned aircraft, and other missiles, so it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Though it never made it past the concept phase, the Diamondback was a nuclear-armed Sidewinder variant considered by the Navy in the 1950s. Perhaps it never saw the light of day, because even by American standards, firing a nuclear-tipped missile at a relatively small enemy aircraft just seemed a bit like overkill. With more than 100,000 units produced since the mid-50s, Sidewinders are the oldest, most reliable, and widely produced air-to-air -air missiles in the world, and they're still found in the arsenals of dozens of countries around the world today. Though less than 1% have been used in combat, they're responsible for more than 300 kills, and at just $400,000 a pop, they're even affordable for countries like Thailand, Ethiopia, and Cameroon, which have relatively small military budgets compared to Western nations like America and Britain. In the early 2000s, the old missile turned 50. Huge contracts to manufacture and support Sidewinders well into the 2050s in America and abroad keep rolling in to companies like Boeing and Raytheon, and according to the Air Force, they'll still be in service until at least 2055 and perhaps decades longer. If so, Sidewinders will join a very exclusive club of weapons that remain in use after hitting the century mark, like the M1 Black Dragon Howitzer, which, in case you missed it, was recently featured over on our sister channel, Mega Projects. Please do check it out. There will be a link in the description below. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you again to Conflict of Nations for sponsoring. Remember, if you want to jump into their grand strategy game, use the link in the description to start playing, and that'll get you the bonus 13,000 gold and a month of free premium. It's a cool deal, and thank you for watching.